So, we have with us here Mara. Mara is the CTO of Fusion Engineering, a sponsor of this meetup, first and foremost, and also a company that produces uh, uh, drones and uh, software drones. She is also the leader of the uh, Rust Libs team, um, which manages the standard library, I guess, yes. and everything that goes into developing the standard library, which is, uh, a, as I imagine, pretty complicated process. So we thought we, it would be interesting to ask Mara some questions, um, both about her work uh, at Fusion and about her work as the Rust Lips team lead. So I want to start it off just to ask, like, how did you get started with Rust? Um, that's a good question. My memory is very bad. Um, I think it wasn't. Oh, it's not. Try How again. Right now? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it was 2019 I started using it seriously. I think 2016, 17, I experimented a bit. You know, read the Rust book, forget about it. Then a year later, try it again, forget all about it. I think in 2019, I was really busy with Fusion. And then we had our uh, software in C. And I was experimenting a bit on the side with Rust and I was really excited about it and started writing, rewriting some parts in, in Rust. At first, some separate command line tools and things like that that you can easily replace without affecting the rest of the system. And I think it was a year later that I just decided, let's rewrite everything in Rust. <laughs> That's not something you can usually do at a company, but you know, if you own all of it, then you can just say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's what we did. It was kind of a wild ride to just, you know, drop everything, spend... YOLO. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and I think it's the best decision we ever made. It, uh, it worked out very well. So just two quick follow-up questions about that. So what were some of the problems that you were seeing with C++ that you thought would, Rust would help solve? And also, how much code did you have at the time you decided to rewrite and how long did it take to rewrite? Um... So an interesting problem we or problem an interesting thing we have at Fusion is that most of the people we have and also had back then are not software engineers. Um, they write software, but their main background is in like control engineering or aerospace mechanical engineering, lots of things like that. Um, because that's where we're innovating. We're doing cool things with software, but the real innovation lies in, in the control theory. Um, so they mostly learn programming on the job and learning rust turned out to be so much easier than learning c++ at least for them um in c++ i had to spend so much more of my time explaining all the weird pitfalls they kept falling into um and in rust the compiler would do half of the job for me <laughs> like if they didn't initialize variable in c++ then they might get a warning depending on how they wrote their code or it just i don't know randomly starts behaving behaving differently in a simulator and in the actual uh flight which was bad and whereas if they do it in rust the compiler just tells them yeah you, you need to do this and then they would just do that so that when we switched to rust i noticed that it took most people like two or three weeks at most from very basic, maybe like Python or MATLAB experience to actually being productive in Rust. Like they didn't know everything, but enough to, yeah, be useful and feel productive in it, which was not at all what we had in C++. Sounds great. So um, I had a follow-up question, which I forgot, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. the. So I think we didn't get to how many lines of code did you have? I have how no long clue. Did it take? <laughs> how long did the rewrite take? Um, so the interesting thing which helped a bit is that from the start, we had a uh, software architecture that where all the different components were different processes. So our flight controllers run Linux and all the different parts like the state estimator, which, produ which processes the sensor data, the um, uh, flight controller, logging systems, I think like at that time, I think six, seven different systems or something, by now it's more, were all different processes uh, that communicated with each other. So the first thing I did was basically wrote the uh, this, the library for inter-process communication that we use in C++, also wrote a copy of that in Rust, 
and then we could replace those units one by one. Mm. The very first thing we rewrote, um, other than some small tools, is a state estimator, which at that point was our biggest blob of code. Um, that was also where we spent, like, I, I think at that point, like half of our time in the entire history of the company by that point was spent on that particular tool. Uh, and that was not because it was the easiest, it was because it was the hardest. I was a bit worried because we were using a lot of C++ features that Rust didn't have. Um, and I was worried if we were to rewrite it, we would run into those things too much. So I was like, let's take the hardest thing where we use all of, <laughs> all of those features and see how it would look like in Rust. It was quite a challenge, but it, the end result was much nicer to work with. It compiled faster. It had actually more type safety because we actually, because of some features that were lacking, we were forced to do it in a better way, which is kind of the thing that we keep like running what? into. <laughs> it's kind of the thing that we keep running into with Rust all the time. Um, it's kind of forced to do things in a cleaner way and the end result is much better. Um, and I think that particular thing took, it was just me and the main control engineer just basically doing a bit of a marathon for a few weeks. I think after a month, month we had something that was up to par for, um, that we could actually use. And I think maybe three, four months later, I think almost everything was switched. Great. That sounds really nice. Um, yeah, the question I was going to ask next was about unsafe rest. So my I haven't worked on drones, but I imagine there is quite a bit of unsafe rust or like no SD low level code in there. So how much unsafe rust is there or was there and how much of an issue was that for the people who weren't necessarily software engineers by trade? We have almost no, no SD rust because we just run on Linux um, and we have um, very little unsafe also. So that's in the process communication library. Uh, had a lot of unsafe, but Rust allows you to encapsulate it very nicely. So this this library that we made, it was very easy from the outside to use in the interface. So it was very simple. You just you know define your data structure of the things you want to share with the other process, and just have a function send basically. Um, and everything else just happens on the inside. Um, so yeah, those parts were probably hard to read to to most people at the company at the time luckily we now have a bunch more software engineers sitting in the back over there <laughs> um, um but in like the actual control systems related code yeah a few weird cases where we had to use unsafe but so basically a very there. small amount yeah. of unsafe rest great Okay, and um, yeah, how did how did it go from there that you got involved in the Rust project in the Libs team? Um, yeah, that's a good question. How did it start? <laughs> I think it started with me getting bored. That's how it usually starts. <laughs> um, I think it was in 2020 that oh, I remember. I think my one of my first contributions was the Tau constant. <laughs> I was very insistent on using Tau instead of Pi in our code, but Rust had the decent library included Pi and not Tau, so I wanted to add it. So I sent a pull request for that. Um, I noticed that that had been tried like three or four times before, and every time it was rejected. And I don't know, I managed to get it in by convincing the right people. And I, figured, I, I realized, like, oh, by saying the right words, I can make things happen. That's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> So then I got more ambitious and started trying more things. Um, and at some point it got a bit out of hand with uh, when I started uh, looking very deep into atomics. I think I that started because of that interprocess communication library. Um, and I was unhappy with the way uh, the standard libraries mutex worked on Linux. And I wanted to fix that. But fixing that required a lot of changes, and it turned out to be easier to fix on Windows. So I just started doing that, even though I hadn't touched the Windows computer for 10 years. <laughs> and I kind of got distracted and started contributing a lot of, I don't know, all kind of things that were vaguely related to the thing I originally cared about, but uh, I was in a role, so I just kept going. And at some point, uh, I think David Tolney reviewed most of my um, uh, pull requests at that point, and he started noticing a pattern of me coming back every time with more. At some point, he reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be a reviewer, which I found very exciting. It felt like a bit of recognition. Um, and I said yes. 
Uh, he called it a, a thankless job at the time, so he warned me <laughs> to really think about it before saying yes. And it was really nice to do, but it's the problem with it is that's basically an infinite job. The more you review, the more pull requests will come in, and the more work you have. So you're it's it's infinite stream of work, and there's never any yeah big milestone you reach or something. You're just more pull requests coming in. <laughs> um, but at the time, the library team was not in a very healthy state. I think a year before that, um, the uh, former lead of the library team had left and the remaining people were very busy and didn't have regular meetings at that point. There were lots of issues nominated to be discussed by the library team, but never really happened. And around the time when I started contributing, um, one of the members, Ashley Mannix, started organizing meetings again. I joined those meetings and yeah, after a few weeks of doing that and being active in those meetings, they asked me if I wanted to join as a, a full member. Um, and more and more, I started taking over with uh, uh, like organizational work, um, like or writing the meeting agendas, collecting the, the issues that we should talk about, um, things like that. And after a while, I, I uh, actually uh, stepped back and it was yeah, me mostly running all that stuff. Um, we had some changes also in the members of the team and um, yeah, how the teams work, we stretched a bit, but that all happened super fast. I think my contributions started in October and by January I became team lead, I think. So. Convincing people with words, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. And so what uh, what do you see as the most important challenges for the LIBS team at this point? Basically the same as for the entire REST team. We, I actually wrote a blog post about this. It's called REST is not a company. And I think that's our strength, but also a problem sometimes is that it's, we rely on just productive contributors just randomly showing up and doing work. And if it doesn't happen, then there's not that much we can do. So if you, if I want something to happen, I either do it myself or just <laughs> wait for someone to show up to do it. I can't really assign work to anyone, right? I'm not a manager there, um, which is great, but it also means that it's, there's lots of work that just doesn't get done unless someone is excited enough to do it. And it's, there's a lot of funding now for, for a lot of people working on Rust coming from big companies that start to care more about Rust like Microsoft, Amazon, Huawei, etc., which is really nice, but the companies often care a lot about specific features and they often don't think so much about all the work that goes on behind the scenes that make it all possible. And getting that funded is tricky because, you know, if you can put on your slides like, oh, this year we finished, we, we, we stabilized the uh, you know, async in Rust or something, then that's a really good achievement to show to upper management. But if you say, okay, this year we, I don't know, prevented the Rust project from collapsing by just having meetings every day, then <laughs> that doesn't sound too exciting, right? Um, so yeah, I think, especially for the library team, but also for quite a few other teams, we need to make sure we have a healthy amount of people who are, who can commit enough of their time to it. Um, what usually happens is either someone can not commit that much time and slowly, yeah, does less and less, or people get really excited and do more and more and burn themselves out and then leave. And ideally we find some kind of middle ground there where, you know, things can be stable for a bit longer. Um, I think it's going okay ish, but yeah, I guess, I guess that's something in an open source project that you always struggle with. Um, but it's, it's, it's been getting better for the past few years and. I think the more popular Rust gets, the more people and companies realize how important a lot of the things we do are, and it will it will improve things a lot. Cool. And if someone here was work, working for a company that was able to commit some help to Rust, what would be the best way best way for them to do it? That depends. The problem is that so, so sometimes people show up, they come to me, and like, oh, I have time, I want to help out. What do I do? And I basically tell them, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't manage people, I don't assign tasks. Um, so if you have something that you care about, like you really want one particular, like, I don't know, you want to 
get binary size uh, to to like optimize that or something, and you really care about that, and you, then if you then show up, I, I, me and many others in the team would love to help you achieve that goal. But it's a lot different than working in a company where you work with a team with like um, uh, working towards some milestone with like a manager that that, that you know distribute the task and stuff. Like here, it's very much working on your own. It's a lot of people who are working on their own. They're we're all collaborating, but everyone has a bit of their own goals. And that makes it a bit of a yeah entirely entirely different kind of job than most other jobs. Um, so yeah, you need to. It, it, it happens luckily a lot that people just show up and they are very driven and they just are excited to to uh, yeah get a lot of their like they they have some kind of goal that they want to achieve and then we can often help them figure out how to make that happen. Um, so yeah, if you have some kind of thing that you want for us to do differently, then make it happen. And if you need any help with, with getting there, please ask around and someone can probably mentor you with that. And what about like funding? Is there like, should every company become a member of the Rust Foundation or are there easier or more targeted ways of funding work on Rust? That's a really complicated question. Um, So I personally think that the, the best way you can try to fund a project as a company is see if anyone on the Rust project who's working on the Rust project right now, like uh, uh, contributors, want, uh, need a, a full-time job or can hire them and let them work all for maybe even all of their time on Rust. Um, that seems much more effective than trying to sponsor people if you are here or there. Or, um, I am hoping that at some point the foundation will be swimming in money. You can just throw it at all, uh, everyone in the team. But right now they have enough money to give out grants like uh, twice a year. They give out some grants. Those are like 10,000 euros uh, per up to 20,000, I think, per six months, which is nice, but it doesn't get close at all to any like software uh, job you can get at a, at a bigger company. Um, I'm hoping that would change at some point, but it gets really tricky. So right now you see that a lot of people contributing a lot to Rust who are not burning out, actually have a full-time job somewhere and their employer lets them spend a lot of their time on Rust because they see it, how it indirectly benefits them. So actually contributing time is maybe more effective or easy than contributing money. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it comes down to the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, so at some point you decided to write a book. Can you tell yes. us about how that went down? Um, how did that happen? Um, you got bored. Yes. <laughs> right. I got bored and wrote a bunch of blog posts. Um, uh, what was it? Oh, right. Those blog posts about uh, inline Python. Those got pretty popular. Uh, just like people on Hacker News and Reddit and all the bad websites were talking about it. Um, and then a editor from O'Reilly reached out to me asking if I would be interested in writing more because they like my writing style. And they basically asked me if I wanted to write a book about Rust as a whole, I think. And I was like, no way, I'm not going to write a thousand page book. <laughs> it's basically unbounded. It's, uh, I don't have the time or focus for that. I suggested some other topics and we talked about some ideas, but in the end, they were not too interested yet in something that was so specific as uh, Rust Atomics. Um, and then a year later, um, they called back and they said, you know what, things have changed. We're actually more interested now in also publishing smaller books with a more specific topic. Um, I think a big part of that was because it started getting more popular and they wanted to do more books on it. They weren't just looking to publish one book on Rust, but like a whole series of it. Um, and yeah, that was in the summer of 2021. Yeah. And then spent a whole year on, well, mostly procrastinating <laughs> and sometimes writing a bit for in, in a weekend. Um, and then now, yeah, a year later, now there is a book. Cool. Uh, I think it's gotten a pretty good 
response, right? Or yeah, it's been incredible. There's there's about a few weeks ago, I got uh, I was talking with the editors about um, the sales numbers for January, and they made some prediction, which I already thought was very high. And then a week later, they had the actual numbers, and they were more or twice as high than the thing that I already <laughs> thought was high. Like several, like many thousands have already been sold in just January, which is very surprising to me because it's a very specific topic. Most people working in Rust do not directly touch these things. But I also think that most Rust programmers are just like super curious how everything works under the hood. And I think that helps. Um, and I guess it also helps to have a lot of Twitter followers. I just <laughs> buy my book, people just do that. <laughs> Cool. Um, so I think that's pretty much all the questions I had. So we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. If anyone's got a question, please come up, take the mic and ask away. Hi. So my question is, uh, given uh, the Rust is a huge language and also complicated to learn, uh, at least for me, so uh, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, what's the process in a library team to accept something in the standard library? Uh, what's the process? Like, wh how do you measure cost and benefits before accepting it? And the follow-up is, will Rust standard library will ever have date time and a random package? So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so what is and it, what should and shouldn't be part of the Rust standard library is always an interesting discussion. We don't have a clear document right now that specifies what should and shouldn't be in there. So it's basically the, the, the only real answer I can give you is whatever the team at that moment feels like. Um, but in practice, it basically means that if we think it's fine to leave it in an external crate, we prefer that because if you put something in a standard library, you can never change it again because next another crate can just release a 2.0 and a 3.0 of it. But standard library is never going to have, or well, for the foreseeable future, not going to have a, a 2.0. So everything we do has to be backwards compatible and it's very hard to change things. Um, so yeah, the process, what it's like is that someone proposes some feature and um, sometimes I first get check with some, some smaller working groups or they check on some discord or on, on like the internals forum, get some feedback from the community if, and then if they feel confident enough, they propose it to the team. And at that point, we don't need to be fully convinced yet. If we think it might have a chance, we might like it, then we often accept it as an unstable feature. And that means people can use it all nightly and people can use it in the Rust compiler itself to get some experience with it. And then it often goes through some changes, maybe some, some very small changes, maybe sometimes renaming some things. And then after a while, if someone, if the discussion has died down around it, then it seems there, some, there is some kind of <coughs> consensus that we might want this, then someone can propose stabilization. And at that point, uh, the majority of the team members need to, uh, of the API team need to approve it. And not a single team member needs to have concerns. If any single team member has concerns, it's not going through. Um, so it's not like a democracy. It's like a, like we really want to go for consensus. Like not a single team member needs to uh, be opposed. Um, and yeah, after stabilize, it takes like uh, it goes into uh, nightly, then and every six weeks nightly gets bumped to beta and then to, uh, to stable. So sometimes it happens that within the time period someone finds out some horrible mistake and we revert, but usually we catch it before that. Um, and the other question was uh, whether uh, random numbers or and dates and time would be part of the standard library. Um, date and time, probably not, but this is just my opinion. Um, I, I think there are too many subtle, complicated things going on there, too many different requirements yeah, for different kind of applications that it doesn't necessarily make sense in standard library. In the majority of software I've written, I would not use that part. Things like the duration instant types we have right now are important in many programs, but dealing with, I don't know, leap years or something is a lot less relevant for a lot of software and how much, I don't know, 
you, you can go very far with this, right? Do you want to do, do support for time zones and, and daylight saving time? And do you want to, I don't know, you can go very far with that stuff. And that seems best main, maintained as part of a separate library. For random numbers, it's a bit similar. It's like the basic thing, like just give me random bytes seems very fundamental and we might have that at some point. Um, the popular crates for random numbers also have support for like all kind of distributions kind of different types. And it's also a very big topic on its own where I'm not sure if we are, if we have the time and energy and the number of people and the team to properly maintain the full set of things. So it will always be like just a few simple things and people will still reach out for some external crate for if they need more complicated things. And at that point you might wonder why not just leave everything there. Um, I will say that the standard library technically does have support for random numbers because of its hatch maps, which uh, use a random seed. Um, and so we will probably expose at some point the, the uh, just a function for uh, getting random bytes from the operating system. Um, someone, I think one of the maintainers of the get random trades were pushing for that. Um, and I think that's one of those uh, things that just got stuck on something. I remember reviewing that entire crate to see whether it would be suitable for the standard library. And I think at that point, it, the discussion just died down and it never happened. But if anyone cares about doing it, then feel free to pick that up and it might actually happen. As the chrono maintainer, I agree that there's a lot of complications with date time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, come forward. Uh, well, it's actually very simple. It's a one-word question. It's called the panic. <laughs> <laughs> panic. So, uh, in, in all the things you, 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 you've been talking about, how did you deal with it? So, for example, going from C to or C++ to Rust, uh, and now in the libraries, uh, if you want to avoid panic, it's very hard at the moment. Is there a way to go about that? Avoiding panics? Yeah, it was mentioned in one of the talks earlier. Um... It's not a problem I have personally run into a lot, I'll admit. Um, I feel like in nearly every case where I got annoyed at a panic, it was something that my equivalent C or C++ code would have done something worse. Um, so it takes a while. It took a while for me, and I saw that also at, at uh, Fusion, uh, for everyone who learned Rust, to get used to um, yeah, using Rust types and enums and etc. to structure codes to never use unwrap basically. Um, and but once you start, yeah, getting used to that, then lots of remaining panics don't seem. I don't know things that that are happening a lot more in Rust than in other languages. Um, It, 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 it is a thing that keeps coming up though, like lots of people would really like to be able to write code and have a guarantee it never panics. Um, it's a really, really tricky thing and right now Rust is not really a language that's designed for that kind of thing. It's designed to for, for lots of different things, but also like for, for the, uh, with the borrow checker for management, but we don't have any anything specifically for panics. Maybe whatever language will replace Rust in the next then 20 years we'll have something about that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like in Rust you can avoid most of it by making proper use of um, like basically everything that was explained in the last talk. Um, if you if you express all your possible states and everything you can do and, and match them one to one with how you express things in Rust, then in, at least for all the software we have at Fusion, we, we were able to not really have this problem. Okay. Thanks. I think we have to stop with the questions now because there's stuff waiting for us downstairs. Um, so one more thing I'm going to do is to run the random number generator.